Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, today we honor and celebrate on the Trioti of the Sunday of the uh, Prodigal Son. It's a story that we know very well. And if we should analyze the entirety of this parable, we could be here for many hours. Where every time you read it, uh, you can learn something new. Uh, within it, you, you have three main characters, two brothers and a father, who are supposed to symbolically uh, represent mankind and God the Father. And it didn't be here about the young son who wants his inheritance, he wants to go out into the world, to live his life apart from the Father, the way he sees was spent according to his will, and the Father allows him to do this. And once the son becomes uh, destitute, goes through all his inheritance, he returns, comes to his senses, and he returns to the, the loving Father. In it, we can see, uh, if we look from a perspective of, of the people at the time who would have heard this parable, to have a son and ask for the father's inheritance, to that which was meant to be given to him upon the father's death. What the son is actually saying here is that he wishes the father was dead. I wish you were dead so I could have my inheritance. This is how he would have heard it. And this is how the people would have received it when they heard this parable. And so we hear the son, not just asking for his inheritance, he's saying, Father, I wish you were dead so I could have my inheritance. And so the son wanted the father dead, in a sense, in his heart. Um, it reminds me when I hear that uh, this 19th century the philosopher, the great philosopher Nietzsche, who was no fan of, of, uh, of God, uh, he, he, he pretty much said that God was dead. In fact, this is his quote, he says, he says, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was the holiest and mighty of all the world has yet uh, owned, his, has, has owned his blood to death under our knives? Who will wipe his blood off of us? What water is there for us to cleanse ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? And many would say that Nietzsche is supposed to hear and, and commenting on the Enlightenment period of mankind, that he has now proven the existence of God is no longer. But what he really is saying that God no longer not only did he never exist, but he doesn't exist within our hearts, and that the philosophy and the reasoning of mankind has come to this conclusion that God truly is dead, and he doesn't exist. And to a point, he, he is correct, because this is the way the society has gone for centuries, and the doubt of our minds. And we too, even though we profess here in this church that we are believers of God and that we love God, we too, from time to time, in our minds, do not we not say, I wish God was dead? And what I mean by that, do not we say that we wish we did not have to deal with that burden of God, the things that God has put upon our shoulders, just so to speak, that we could be our own person and do our own thing and live according to our own will. This is precisely what the young man, the young son did in the parable today. He wished God was dead so that he could live his life according as he wished and not have the father looking over his shoulder. And so we know in this parable how it ends for this young man. That the famine hits the world and he is destitute. He's lost everything because he made not wise decisions. Chose to do it his way and his way didn't work. But he came to his senses. He came to his senses, it says in this parable. And he plays to his father and wishes nothing to be but a hired servant. Because his father's servants are living better than he was as this so-called free man. And so he goes back and the father runs to him. Again, if you would have been a person in this time frame that Jesus is telling this parable, that men, particularly elderly men of the community, did not run. In fact, they, in those cultures, they said they walked very slowly. It was seen to rush and to run. It would be a kind of demeaning posture 
for an elder of a community to rush, to run anywhere. But yet, he runs to his son. And he receives them as if he never left. And he says that my son is alive and he was once dead. This is the irony, isn't it, in this parable? That the son wishes that the God, his father, was dead so that he can inherit what he thought was his and live his life. He wanted the God, his father, dead. And yet it was he who died. And she flips the script at the end. It was the son who died by choosing this, by choosing to live apart from God the Father. And so this is a parable for all of us, and it could be a parable oftentimes as we know it as the prodigal son. But more, uh, more aptly and appropriately, really this parable is, really should be named as uh, the parable of the loving father. Because we're all going to be prodigal sons. Every one of us, brothers and sisters, because even if we are living the most perfect life, in our thoughts, we wish God is dead at times. In our thoughts, we live as though God doesn't exist in our life. And so we're prodigal, and we have to return to God. And no matter what we do, no matter how we thought, no matter how foolish we are, the loving God, the Father, receives us back. This is truly the aim of the whole parable. He receives us no matter what we do. And so why we call it the prodigal son, when we learn from the prodigal son's mistake, what we have to learn is that the love of God the Father is inextinguishable. It's infinite in its mercy. And so this parable is pushed here today to remind us all that we need to come to God. We need to start anew. And He embraces us each and every time we do this. No matter what we do, there's some of us that we pray from God some of us who don't feel like we have a relationship with God, that we're not worthy of God, that we've done things and we cannot bear to approach Him. Even when we sit in this pew and listen to this sermon right now, some of you will say, I understand that God is loving, but I cannot approach Him. There's something keeping you back from approaching Him, something in your heart that says that you're not worthy of Him. I assure you there's nothing you've done worse than the prodigal son did in his life. And God the Father received them with open arms and threw them a banquet and loved them as if he never left. This is truly the God that we worship. This is the God that no one understands. They think he's a stern God with lots of rules and lots of condemnations. Honestly, brothers and sisters, you couldn't be farther from the truth. This is a loving, merciful God. A God that truly loves all of us as children. As his children, which one of us fathers would know if he would give up on our sons, on our daughters? Just like our earthly father is going to give up on us, neither were our heavenly father. So brothers and sisters, let us put aside this foolish notion that God is dead in our hearts and in our minds, even if we think it or act it out, because he truly exists and he truly loves you and he receives you, no matter what you've done in this life. No matter how you feel at any low moment in your life, He is there to embrace you and to bring you back from death, as was the case with the prodigal son. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.